Uh, I don't know whether you realize what an honor it is for us to have uh, Martin Bean uh, here today. He has, of course, been in place at the Open University uh, since October of last year, but it's only last Saturday that he was enthroned uh, as the, uh, the Vice-Chancellor with all of the uh, grandeur that only those who know the OU know that it can provide. Um, when, when it first started, um, I, more than Naomi, was very skeptical about uh, the grandeur side of it. And, uh, of course, the Chancellor and the Vice-Chancellor and uh, the Pro-Chancellor had to have rows, but the faculty on the whole didn't go for it. Um, but the students went for it. That was the point. The, gradu the graduands wanted to have robes. And that took over. And the result was that uh, the uh, graduation ceremonies of the Open University are as blue and gold and grand as you'll find anywhere in the world. I say that with some hesitation, having come from the Magna Carta in Bologna, where the, <laughs> where the vice chancellors of uh, uh, greater Europe come in, I can't tell you what, what, what gear they're wearing, but, but, but it is multisplendent. Anyway, uh, we, are, we have the privilege now of having the first public speech from Martin Bean, the newly enthroned uh, uh, vice chancellor of the Open University, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from him. Martin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good evening. So a little bit about me, I'll put you out of your misery. The accent is Australian. So born in Australia, spent the last 15, 16 years in the United States. Through Amer three American daughters, a wife from Belfast. Yes, we are one screwed up family. So, uh, and I'm also a rather intriguing vice chancellor in that um, you'll notice that if you read a list of vice chancellors in the United Kingdom, it will be prof, 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 mister, prof, 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 because I came from the private sector. So I've joined the Open University from 25 years of working in the ICT industry, in the computer industry, looking at what is the way that technology can actually make a difference in education. For years, software companies and hardware companies have been good at selling technology, to education, but I don't think we've been really good at figuring out ways for it to make a meaningful difference. You know, the, one of the people I uh, worked with recently, Bill Gates, sort of challenged this. He said, you know what? So there are two industries in the world that technology hasn't really transformed the way that it has others, healthcare and education. And part of my job with the Gates Foundation was to go off and try to figure out then how could technology be used to make a difference in learning outcomes, and how could technology be used to really power one of the great enablers or levelers of this world, which is an education. I fundamentally believe to my core, which is why I took this job, that it is almost a basic human right now for somebody to have access no longer to a primary or secondary education, but this is one lonely world if you don't have access to some form of higher education. But higher education, just as it did in Naomi's days with the Open University, can mean very many different things to different people at different times. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we discuss digital literacy here today. So this is the first thing I wanted to touch on. I have to be careful because um, being Australian, I can be long-winded. Um, and I don't want to wait and use all the time because being Australian, I love question and answer time because you can't offend me. So I want to make sure that between Andrew and I, we have plenty of time to take, to take your questions. So luckily he bought a stick. So if you see him nudge me as we're moving through here, you'll know why. But this is the way we commonly think about the digital, digital divide, digital literacy, digital access, whatever you want to call it. You noticed how many politicians have adopted it over the years as a way of, of getting elected. But we, we often characterize it as being cut off from networks and devices, by being cut off from networks and devices. And we're fixated at times at reporting wonderful statistics 
about how many people actually have access. And I thought I'd share a few with you. So Digital Britain 2008 report suggested that there are about 13.9 million adults in the UK who are digitally excluded. A third of the UK population, um, 17 million over the age of 15 are digitally excluded. The socially disadvantaged are more than three times more likely to be digitally excluded. At least 15% of the population, about 6 million people, are both socially and digitally excluded. Kind of none of those statistics, I think, are very shocking for people in the room. And I'm not going to dwell a lot on sort of those statistics. But there was one that I found that I thought was kind of interesting that I wanted to give you as a backdrop. Projections suggest generational change will mean that by 2021, 15% of the population will be digitally excluded as compared to 29% in 2009 based on the projections. Um, and what does that mean? Well, what that means is generationally, I think this problem is gonna get sorted out. I think generationally, the ability to just simply get people plugged in, it's gonna sort itself out. But I don't think that's the challenge that we have for ourselves. I think getting people connected is simply the beginning of the journey because what's really important to us um, is to actually figure out ways for people to make sense and meaning of this digital age that, that we live in. And you know, there's, there's a very strong social, personal, individual reason why we wanna make that happen. But what's interesting is there's also an incredibly economically valuable reason why as a nation we should think about that. You know, the more the government and the private sector move services online, um, and if you look at e-government, go and study up a little bit about e-government policies, and you'll see it's all about how can we move as many of the services online for provision as we possibly can, which is terrific for those that are digitally literate and know how to use it. But according to the um, economic case for digital inclusion, um, if all digitally excluded adults went online, and made just one digital contact each month instead of using another means, it would save an estimated 900 million pounds per annum for one transaction per month. And so what's interesting to me is that any economic argument that could be mounted about not wanting to address issues of digital literacy and digital inclusion, um, no matter what level you look at it, an individual level, um, a unit level, a government level, or economically, as I'll talk a little bit about, it doesn't add up. Um, but the, one of the first notions I want, or seeds I wanted to plant with you tonight, is that it's not just solving that problem, so please don't stay there. Please don't buy in on the rhetoric that it's just about household usage and broadband connectivity and you know, mobile access to 3G networks and cloud-based services and blah, 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 blah. Welcome to my old world. It's much more about what are we gonna do with them? What's the value of that when we get them there? And I wanna talk a little bit about that uh, with you um, this evening as we move through the presentation. 